take a few minutes and, and go back and continue our series of study. Uh, been in a series studying apostolic doctrine, and um, we want to continue that. Last week we started dealing with this glorious gift of the Holy Ghost. And uh, we didn't really get very far in our notes. And in fact, I didn't, I didn't do a very good job of following my notes last week. Uh, not promising to do it this week either. But uh, I'm going to try to try to uh, address this subject once again. And, um, you know, church, I don't, I don't ever want us to, number one, I don't want us, I don't want us to grow tired of hearing apostolic doctrine. I don't want us to reach a place where it does not, uh, it's not important to us or where we feel like it's not necessary that we hear it again and again. It is necessary, and it is important, the significance of what's being recorded and put on the website. And uh, even if you look around and say, well, everybody that's here knows this, you don't know who else might be listening. Yesterday, standing in a line of literally thousands of people, my wife and I were standing there, and a woman walked up to me and said, are you a pastor? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I thought so. She said, we have been, uh, we found you online, and we've been listening. And she said, my husband wants to be baptized because of what we've heard. Now, I don't even know where she lives. Her area code is not anywhere uh, in the Kansas City area. Uh, it's more western Kansas uh, based on the area code. That doesn't mean that's where she's still living, and we all know how that works. But um, all I know is that she recognized me and knew what we preached and taught because of what's being put on the website. And uh, she said, you can expect us to show up. So I'm hoping it won't just be your husband that wants to be baptized. Hallelujah. But I'm just telling you, church, the, the, you, you just don't know the extent of what God is doing sometimes. And, and we may not see the physical evidence ourselves, but God is doing things we're not even aware of. And I'm, so we're going to go back today and we're going to be dealing with, as I said, this subject of the Holy Ghost and uh, in fact, even on this subject, we got a message uh, just the other day after this lesson was posted, a pastor's wife here in the area who said, we are listening. We have not finished yet. We are listening to this message. And she said, all I can say is, wow. Um, we just don't know. We just don't know what God is doing. That's why we must never grow weary in well-doing. The promise is that you shall reap. That word shall gives us a guarantee. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall if you faint not. So let's not faint. Let's keep pushing on and let's keep standing for these glorious truths 
and watch God lead hungry people into the truth. I've said it over and over again, I believe, and it has even been prophesied that the things that are happening in Africa are going to happen right here. That's been said over and over and over again. And I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. Praise God. Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse number 1. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. Hallelujah. Acts 2 verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddens of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Amen. I said last week, I say again, this is what I want to happen to every one of us over and over and over. I want us to be continually filled with the Holy Ghost. I want us to stay full of the Holy Ghost. Not just have it, but stay full of the Holy Ghost. Would you put your Bibles down and uh, lift your hands, lift your voices to the Lord right now? Would you ask him to help us in the remainder of this service? Everybody, let's pray right now. Let's ask for God's touch. Lord. name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Praise God, praise God. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Last week, um, we talked about the Holy Ghost. We talked about what it is, um, rendering of that term and calling it the Holy Ghost. The reason why I like that is because we all understand What is meant by a ghost? It is the spirit of one who has departed. And in fact, in this case, it's not just anyone, but it is the Holy One. Amen. That's what he was called in Mark 124, the Holy One. And, and so when the Holy One departed and his spirit came back, we call that the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. It is also called the Spirit of God. It's referred to as the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Truth. And yet we know there's only one Spirit. Amen. Only one Spirit. Now, what we, what we spent most of our time dealing with yesterday, uh, or last week, uh, we actually dealt with, uh, the promise that was given, the Old Testament, understanding that God had given to the Jews a covenant. And um, in that covenant, he had laws that he expected them to keep. But God began to speak through the prophets of old and tell them, I am going to give you a new covenant. And this covenant is going to be unlike the last one. 
Now, where many, many people today get it wrong is they think the new covenant now has no boundaries. There are no requirements. There, There is no law, they say, in the new covenant. That's not true. The difference between the new covenant and the old covenant is that God did not write the laws of the old, of the new covenant upon tables of stone the way he did with the old covenant. But he instead wrote those laws on the tables of our heart. The big difference between the new covenant and the old is that God gave with this new covenant the power to keep the covenant. That's the real difference. Amen. God empowered us to live the way he has always wanted us to live. This New Testament, some in our Tuesday night lessons, but this is not a period whereby God simply says, live like you want to, and I'll save you anyhow. That's not what God is doing in this New Testament era. What God is doing is, he said, if you'll come to me the way you are, I'll cleanse you, I'll forgive you of your past, but then I will give you the power to live like I want you to live from this point forward. But it's still all about living a life that's pleasing to him. I just uh, this past week taught a lesson to uh, some of the uh, pastors in Swaziland, did it for my uh, my second time, I just started doing this the last couple of weeks, but uh, meeting with them electronically and visiting with them uh, over Skype and uh, teaching lessons while they're sitting there in the class. But I, I began to deal with them and to stress to them that, that uh, we've got it so wrong and we've become so arrogant that now churches are telling people you should accept Christ. That is the height of arrogance. This is not about us accepting Christ. It's about us becoming acceptable to God. That doesn't mean we get good enough for God to save us. It means God saves us and starts making us good. Hallelujah. It's not, it's not by works of righteousness that I have done. And all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. You understand that? This is where the new covenant is. Is that God imparts to us his righteousness. Again, misconception. Churches teach that and they think what that means is go ahead and live like a sinner and God considers you righteous. That's not at all what's going on. God imparts his righteousness And by that he means he gives us the power to be righteous as he is. Our Savior. Now, understand this is a man that for years used to preach, except Christ as your Savior. And now has gotten a revelation that that's not the case. He said, here's the way that I explain it. He said, I want you to imagine my wife and I are married and she is guilty of immorality. And and I want to be reconciled. And so she tells someone, well, I will accept my husband back. He said, I didn't do anything for her to decide whether she wants to accept me. She's the one that's guilty of wrong. So it's not whether or not she'll accept me. It's whether or not I'll accept her. I said, that's a perfect example because all we like sheep have gone astray. Every one of us have committed sin and it's not about whether or not we can stand back and say, okay, God, I'll accept you. No, it's about us reaching a place that God says, I know you sinned. I know you were wrong. I know you transgressed my commandment. But if you'll repent... If you'll be baptized in my name and wash all of that away and then promise that by my help, you're not going to go back to that lifestyle, then I'll accept you. That's what it's really all about. Amen. So that's that's kind of where we got uh, um, 
engaged last week in this lesson. It's where uh, we spent most of our time was dealing with that empowerment that comes through the Holy Ghost. Uh, we're not really finished with that subject. In fact, what I want to do today as we deal with the Holy Ghost, I just want to ask you a question as we get started in today's portion of the lesson, uh, a question that someone perhaps may ask you sometime, and that is, why should I receive the Holy Ghost? Why should I receive the Holy Ghost? Torment? They ought to desire that experience. Well, praise God. Amen. But just in case that's not good enough, let me give you some scriptural answers today as to why you should receive the Holy Ghost. We did deal with this somewhat last week. Let me just touch on it again today, not go in depth. But but let me tell you, uh, the first reason why you need the Holy Ghost is so you can get saved. You're not saved without the Holy Ghost. Romans 8 Verse 9, we read this last week. I think these were some of the last scriptures we read, so we're going to go back and just touch on them as we set the stage to go forward today. Romans chapter 8, verse 9 says this. But ye are not in the flesh. You're not in the flesh. But in the spirit. But in the spirit. If so be. If, if so be. That the spirit of God, the dwell, spirit in of you. God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Again, there's not a spirit of Christ and then uh, a Holy Spirit and then spirit of the Father. There's not three spirits. So regardless of how we refer to this spirit, we're talking about the same thing. And he said, if you don't have the spirit of Christ, you don't belong to God. I'm here to tell you without the Holy Ghost, you are not saved. This is not a second work of grace. Some people teach you get saved and then you can receive the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you without the Holy Ghost, you never got saved. Of course, there were some that have through the years have taught three works of grace. You're saved, then you're sanctified, then you're filled with the Holy Ghost. I, I again tell you, none of it, none of it, none of it's true. Without being filled with the Holy Ghost. You're not saved and you're not sanctified. Without the Holy Ghost. Amen. Here's what Jesus said in John chapter 3 and verse 5. Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto you. Truly, truly, I tell you. Except a man be born. Unless a man is born of of water. water, That is, unless he's baptized in Jesus' name. And, and of the spirit, unless he is born, I'm not being judgmental. I didn't judge anybody. I'm reading the sentence that the judge of all judges has already issued. This is his judgment, not mine. Hallelujah. I mean, that'd be like going to court, somebody being in court and being found guilty. And the judge saying, you're going to spend 30 days in jail. And so the bailiff says, all right, 30 days in jail. And the, and the accused looks at them and says, well, who are you to send me to jail? You're just a bailiff. What authority do you have? Don't judge me. The bailiff says, I didn't judge you. That man up there in the black robe sitting behind that bench, he's the one that judged you. I'm just repeating his sentence. When I tell you you're not going to heaven without the Holy Ghost, I didn't judge you. God did. I'm just reading his sentence. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. The Bible tells us we have to be led by the Spirit of God in order to even consider ourselves a son of God. Romans chapter 8 verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. As many as are led by the Spirit. Now tell me how you're going to be led by that Spirit if it's not living on the inside of you. You've got to have the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Spirit is the proof of God's abiding presence. First John chapter 3 and verse 24. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him and he in him. 
And hereby we know that he abides and in us. And hereby we know that he abides in us. How? By the spirit. By the which he spirit. Given us. Which he has, this us. is what John said. The way we know whether or not God is living in us is simple. Do you have the Holy Ghost? If you don't have the Holy Ghost, God is not. I don't care that you've made a profession of faith. I don't care that you believed on the Lord. I don't care that you say you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior. The question is, do you have the Holy Ghost? Do you have the Holy Ghost? In fact, I think we read this last week, but let's go. It's not in your notes. Go over to Acts chapter 19 again. I want to show you when Paul met some believers, there were two things he wanted to know from those believers. And these ought to be the two questions that we ought to ask every believer. All right, you tell me you're a believer, but I want to know these two things. Acts chapter 19, beginning with verse 1. And it came to pass came that to while, pass. At, while Apollos was while at Corinth, Apollos was at Corinth Paul, Paul, having passed through the, the upper coast, coast came, to Ephesus, came to Ephesus, finding certain, finding disciples, certain disciples. He said unto them, said to them question you, number one, have you received the Holy have Ghost? Have you received you the Holy Ghost since you believe? That's question number one. I want to know if you've got the Holy Ghost. Now, why do you want to know that, Paul? We've already de- we've already decided they're believers. I'll tell you why. Because belief is not enough. They do not have God in them if they've not received the Holy Ghost. Right. So I want to know: Do you have the Holy Ghost? Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, unto they him, said unto him, "We've we not, not so, so much as heard whether there be, whether any, there Holy be any Holy Ghost." And he said unto them, "So he asked him a second question: Unto what then? Unto were you what baptized? then were you baptized?" And they said, and "They said unto, unto John's, John's baptism. baptism." And so there were two things that Paul wanted to know: Number one, do you have the Holy Ghost? Number two, how were you baptized? My friends, these are the questions of the ages. For these are the questions that determine whether a person is saved or not. That's not my judgment. That's the judgment of Jesus Christ. Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And so Paul said, look, you may have some good things. You may have a relationship of some kind, but I want to tell you, you're not going to get in that kingdom if you haven't been born of water and born of the spirit. So I want to know today, have you received the Holy Ghost? Have you been born of the spirit? And I want to know, have you been? Yeah. And they said, we were baptized, and we were baptized by John the Baptist. Brother Phillips just this past Friday night read where Jesus said of those born of women, there's none greater than John the Baptist. So that's pretty good credentials, John the Baptist baptized you. But look what happens. Keep reading. Verse 4. Then said Paul, John barely baptized, John barely baptism, baptized of repentance, baptism of repentance, saying unto, saying the, unto people the people that they, that they should, should believe on believe him, believe on him, should come, after, should come him. after him. That, that is, is on, on Christ, Christ Jesus. Jesus. And when they heard this, when they heard this, they were baptized. They were baptized. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Now wait, they've already been baptized once. They were baptized by the greatest man born of women. They were baptized by John the Baptist. He meant, but Paul baptized them again. I'm telling you, just going down in the water is not sufficient. You gotta go down in the name that is above every name. For neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. Amen. Well, we're not here to teach on baptism today. We're trying to talk about the Holy Ghost. But I'm just telling you, you are not saved. If you've not received the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's read Romans 8 verse 11. I think we closed with this last week. Romans 8 verse 11. But if the spirit if, of him. Everyone say if. if. Does everyone understand the significance of that little two letter word? If the spirit of him. That raised, that up, raised Jesus up Jesus from the dead. From dwell the dead in you. Dwells in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead. He that raised up Christ from the dead. Shall also quicken, shall also your, mortal quicken your mortal body. By his spirit, by that, dwells his spirit in you. that dwells in Now look, with that word, if. You understand. There, that there is a clear, unspoken statement. Anytime the word if appears. 
And the unspoken statement is the opposite of that if. Whatever's going to ha- not live in you, then what's going to happen? You're not going to be raised up in the last day. I'm telling you, you cannot be saved without the Holy Ghost. But it goes beyond. Why should you receive the Holy Ghost? Not just to get saved. You need the Holy Ghost in order to stay saved. That's true. Now let me just, let me just hit on this this morning and I don't really have time to go into it, uh, in depth, but, but let me, let me, um, uh, let me just touch on it this morning, give you a couple of scriptures and, and, uh, and then move on. But when I say you gotta have the Holy Ghost to stay saved, there are those that will hear this that, that will immediately say, no, 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 preacher, once saved, always saved. Unconditional, eternal security. I'm telling you, that's not in the scripture. The Bible does not teach unconditional, eternal security. Certainly never tells us that once you're saved, you're always saved. Let me give you just a few verses to prove that here this morning. Second Peter chapter 1. And verse 10, wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, wait a minute, for what? For what? There's that word again. That word that demands an unspoken statement. For if you do these things, you shall never, you'll never fall. But what if you don't do these things? Then what's the answer? You will fall. If you don't do these things, you will fall. Don't tell me that the scripture says you can't fall from grace. I'm telling you right here, Peter said, there are some things you have to do if you don't want to fall. And if you don't do these things, get ready. You will fall. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. Or if after they have... Now listen to this. If... After they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the, the Lord, knowledge and of the Savior Lord Jesus Christ, and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled. Now in wait earth. a minute. He's talking about people that have been saved. They have escaped the pollution of the world. In fact, the Bible says Jesus came to save his people from their sin. So if we escape the pollution of the world, that means we have been saved from sin. So Peter's dealing with those who have been saved. And he says, if after they've been saved, they are again entangled in those things he delivered them from. And And overcome overcome, the latter end is worse than the with them than the beginning. Oh, they're still saved. Is that what he said? No, sir. Oh, they're still going to go to heaven. It's going to be all right for them when, once they get there. Oh, you know, they're just a wayward son, but they're still saved. That's not what he said. He said their latter end is going to be worse than it was in the beginning. It's going to be worse on them if God saves them from sin and they go back to it. Read on. For it had been better for it them. It would have been better for them. Not to have known, to have the, way not of known the way of righteousness. Than after, than after they, they, have, they have, known have known it. To turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. I'm asking you church. Is there any other way to understand this passage. Except people were once saved. But they're not saved now. They knew the way of righteousness. But they turned away from it. Read. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Now what is this vomit? And what is this mire? It's what? The pollutions of the world. Or sin. Right? It's happened according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again. He's gone right back to the sin that God delivered him of. And the sow that was washed, 
has turned right around and gone back to the mire that she was washed from. He's talking about his hand. But my friend, if you want to jump out, he's not going to force you to stay. That's why I say, backslider, don't point your finger at somebody in the church and say, I'm lost because of them. No, you're not. Because no man can pluck you out of his hand. Nobody can make you leave your service for God. Nobody can force you to backslide. That's a decision you made. Now, I know there are those that may have, that may have offended you. They may have hurt you. They may have, they may have done any number of things. I'm not denying that. But ultimately, the decision to walk out on God was one that you made. Nobody made that for you. Well, hallelujah. Second Peter three. Do you see? We started in, in Second Peter one, then we go to Second Peter two. Now we're in Second Peter three. The apostle deals with this three times in this short epistle. Second Peter chapter three, verse number seventeen. Ye therefore, ye beloved, therefore, uh, seeing beloved, you know, seeing you know these things before, beware lest you beware also, lest you also being led away, being with, the led the away wicked, with the error of the wicked, fall from your fall own steadfastness. From your own steadfastness. He makes it clear: it's happened to them; it can happen to you. Nobody's got an absolute guarantee. We're all going to have to stay prayed up. That's why I'm really not off the subject. I'm telling you, one of the reasons you need the Holy Ghost is to stay saved. Because that allure, that temptation, that thing that we used to wallow in, that thing that we used to love, that thing we used to be so attracted to, if we don't break through, that alcoholic gets carnal. What's he going to do? He's going back to the alcohol. Right? Right? You, you pray a drug addict through, and then he, he gets carnal. He quits praying. What's he, what's he very likely to do? Go back to the drugs, right? You pray a fornicator through. Somebody addicted to pornography. What's going to happen? You get the picture. And Elder Fraser said, that's why I do believe that child molesters can be saved. But he said, I don't want them in my church. Because when they get carnal, what are they going to do? Now, he said that, not me. So don't, don't, uh, just tell you what he said. Praise God. Although I think there's some wisdom in that. If we care about our children. I do want to see people saved. You understand? I want to see people saved. I want to see people delivered. Well... But the fact of the matter is whatever is the weakness of our flesh and the tendencies of our carnality, if we don't stay full of the Holy Ghost, we're going to go back to those weaknesses and those tendencies. So you want to know the answer to that? Stay full of the Holy Ghost. Don't wait six months to pray through again. Don't wait six weeks to pray through again. In fact, don't wait six days to pray through again. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the pull of this world, listen to me, church, it's only going to get worse the closer we get to the coming of the Lord. And if there's it, there's a whole lot about prophecy that I don't claim to know. I don't claim that, that I'm a scholar on that subject. And this church knows that. And I am unapologetic for it. Because every prophecy scholar I know has had to adjust what he was so certain of before. So I'm just one of the honest guys that will tell you I don't know. 
But if there's anything I do know, I do know this, that the Bible says, telling you, if anybody knows that we we're getting close to the return of the Lord, the devil is well aware. And you hear me, he is going to ramp up his efforts to destroy every child of God that he can. If there's ever been an hour when we need to stay full of the Holy Ghost, it's right now. This is not the time for carnality. This is not the time for riding the fence. This is not the time for discouragement. This is not the time for wavering. Is anybody hearing this preacher this morning? This is not the time to grow cold in your walk with God. If you want to be saved, I'm going to tell you what you need to do. As soon as we give this altar call, you need to be in this altar asking God, fill me with the Holy Ghost again. I don't want to face this afternoon without it. I'm telling you, listen to me. And I'm not trying to be harsh and ugly, but I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to stress something to some folks here this morning. I want you, I want you to get a real understanding that you better get desperate about praying through to the Holy Ghost. You better get desperate about it because there is an enemy that is breathing down your neck and he's seeking whom he may devour. And if you think you're strong enough to fight the devil by the power of your flesh, You are messed up in your mind. And that's as kind as I can put it. Let me just state it as it is. If you think you can beat the devil through the power of your flesh, you're crazy. There's not even an ounce of wisdom in you if you think you can do it. You're not big enough, bad enough, smart enough, strong enough to defeat any. You should not let one service go by that you're not in this altar asking God, please, God, don't let me leave this house today without speaking in tongues. Don't let me leave this service today without talking in tongues. Can I just be bold and blunt and, and say something? You know, after 20, almost 23 years of being pastor, if I can't be blunt now, I'll never be able to be blunt. So let me just take my liberty today. Amen. Some of you that have told me it's been a while since you talked in tongues. Look, I love to see you worship. I love to see you run the aisles. But there's something far more important than you run in the aisles. You need to be asking God to fill you with the Holy Ghost. You need to be asking God to let you talk in tongues again. You need a refilling. And when he refills you, run all you want to run. Dance to your heart's content. But running should not take precedent over praying through. Dancing should not be more important than praying through. You need a good praying through. Hey, look, we're in the midst of a spiritual battle, and it's not just us. It's everywhere. The devil is on the rampage because, as I said, he knows he has but a short time. And child of God, you better make up your mind today. I'm going to pray through before this day is over. The sun is not going down on my carnal nature today. I'm going to get full of the Holy Ghost one more time. When I go to sleep tonight, I'm going to go to sleep with an assurance that the Holy Ghost has come and filled me up again. And I've, I've said it, I've said it, and I'll say it again. The more you pray through, the easier it gets. Because really, you reach a point, it's not a matter of praying through. It's a matter of staying through. But when you go six months or more, you hadn't talked in tongues, you're having to fight your way through everything. You're really having to to crucify your carnality all over again. And you're not just going to pray through in two or three seconds. Anyone that works in healthcare can tell you, sometimes you're convinced somebody's dead. And lo and behold, that old heart starts beating again. Kind of the way it happens to us in our carnality. Oh, I really crucified the flesh today. 
And then you get up tomorrow and somebody does you wrong and you're ready to bite their head off. And all of a sudden you said, wait a minute. I'm not as dead as I thought I was. <laughs> yeah, I've been there too. I know, I know, I know whereof I speak. And I think anybody that'll be honest will say the same thing. We all, we, we think we got him dead. We think, man, he's gone. It's over with now. Right circumstance come along. All of a sudden, wait a minute. I think I just saw him breathe again. What was that noise I just heard? I, I think I heard a bone coming from what I thought was a corpse, and it, it ain't a corpse. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. How many times have we read stories of people that have been on life support and the doctor said, man, as soon as you pull that plug, they're gone. They, they, nothing keeping them alive, just the machines making them breathe, the machines making them. And they pull the plug and they hang on, they hang on, they hang on. And once in a while, all of a sudden, the brain starts functioning again. The body starts functioning again. And I mean, it has happened. And they just weren't as dead as everybody thought they were. Even the professionals got it wrong. Can you believe that? A professional got it wrong? Sometimes I think the more professional you are, the more, the more professional you are, the more apt you are to get it wrong. Because <laughs> you get so professional, you think you got everything figured out. All right, all right. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm upsetting a few carnal natures that are not dead yet. That's right. That's right. Uh, I'm just trying to be honest with you. I'm trying to help you today. You need the Holy Ghost not just to get saved. You need the Holy Ghost to stay saved. And I'm telling you, the more you pray through, the happier you'll be. The more you pray through, the easier it's going to be for you to live for God. The biggest struggles you're going to have yeah, that's it. Thank you. That's 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 easy. Everybody gets a hundred on that one. That's the answer. Pray through. Pray through. Pray through. Uh, <clears throat> I remember. It wasn't long after I'd become pastor here. You know, I I can't play the guitar. I've I've tried. I've taken lessons. I don't know how many times. It's just it. I, as much as I say I'd like to do it, the fact is I don't want to do it bad enough to put everything else aside. I enjoy it, you know. I, I, I go and take a few lessons and learn a few chords and I enjoy it. Um, but I don't enjoy it enough to make it a priority. That's just a fact. I'm just telling you the truth. But But I remember not long after I got here, I'd heard a song, and I got Brother Riley to teach me the, the chords on the guitar, and I sang that song at a Christmas banquet. And I'll never forget, there were some folks that that did not like it at all. Looking back, I understand why. But it it was it was a preacher wrote this song, and and the song the song the song just says, "I get tired of the same thing over and over." I get tired, why don't you pray through? I get tired of the same thing over and over. I get tired, why don't you pray through? I get tired of the same thing over and over. And you just sing it over and over. And there was a few folks who didn't like that too well. That's a fact. A lot of this stuff that we, oh, you know, we're, we're having so many problems with, really, it boils down to one thing. Why don't you pray through? Why don't you pray through? Just go pray through. Go get full of the Holy Ghost. Well, I'm feeling really discouraged. Okay, when's the last time you prayed? 
Maybe I need to develop a questionnaire for every time people come in my office for counseling. And, and it'll be one question. When's the last time you prayed through? All right, let's take it from there. Well, it's been a few days. All right, well, look, you go spend time in the altar first. And once you get prayed through, then come back and let's talk. Now, some of these carnal natures are not liking this too much right now either, but it's still a fact. I'm telling you, we need the Holy Ghost Church. We need it not just to get saved. I'm preaching to one God apostolics this morning. Now, we believe you got to repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Ghost. But I'm telling you, it's not just receive the Holy Ghost, period. We got to receive it and receive it and receive it and receive it. We got to keep going back and getting more and more and more and more because this carnal nature does not want to stay dead. You want to talk about resurrections. I'm telling you, our carnality knows how to resurrect itself at the most inopportune moments. And there's only one way to keep it dead, and that's stay full of the Holy Ghost. We just got to go back and pray through again, pray through again, pray through again, pray through again. I just, I just had a, a revelation. You know, I've, I've told the church, time is, oh, my time's nearly up, and I hadn't got very far. Um, I've told the church before that I have got the solution to stopping all gossip. It will stop all gossip if everybody would just obey it. It would stop it all. We would never, ever, ever have a problem with gossip in this church if everybody would just do what I've asked them to do. And what I've asked them to do is this. The minute somebody starts trying to tell you gossip about someone, as soon as it starts, you don't sit and listen to the whole thing. As soon as you know they're gossiping about someone else, you pick up your phone, you dial my number, and you say, here, I'm talking about gossip when he's, when he's dealing with that. And so I'm, I'm just telling you, the only reason that there are gossips is because there are listeners. And if we got rid of the listeners, we'd end the gossip. But I just had another revelation. There's another way to stop it. And that's this. As soon as they start to gossip, say, look, there's an altar down here. Let me help you pray through. But I know, you know, regardless of which way you take it, I know I've had people say, well, I'll hurt their feelings. Well, they don't care whose feelings they're hurting. And they don't care that they're using your ear and mind and heart and spirit as a garbage can. They're not concerned about you and what it's going to do to you. And I'm telling you that by you doing what you're doing, you may save their soul. Quit worrying about hurting their feelings. And start worrying about helping their soul. All right. Some of those undead carnalities. Not liking that too well either. Uh, you gotta, you gotta have the Holy Ghost to stay saved. You got to have the Holy Ghost to stay saved. I was dealing with once saved, always saved. There was one more scripture we didn't get to. Luke chapter 8, verse 13. We didn't get to that one. Let's just go ahead and read it. Throw it in. I'm, I'm off the subject of once saved, always saved. But but let's let's read it. They on the rock are they which when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe and in time, in, in time of temptation fall away. All right. It's clear. Jesus said there are those who will receive it. They're going to accept it. They're going to receive it. Now, if they've never obeyed it, they didn't receive it. So these are people that got saved. But when they got tempted, they walked away. So I'm just telling you, the Bible is absolutely full of examples. There, There is no biblical truth to the concept of once saved, always saved. You know, I've told those pastors in Africa... That doctrine, that doctrine is worse than the doctrine of the Trinity. And the reason they do it is because they believe once saved, always saved. So they think I'm going to heaven anyhow, and I might make a few dollars off of this. No, no. It's not once saved, always saved. you got to live... 
righteously and godly in this present world. And you need the Holy Ghost to do that. Now look, I'm talking about one of the reasons why you need the Holy Ghost is so you can stay safe. So, so the Holy Ghost empowers you to keep you from falling, to keep you from going back to sin. Let me tell you what else it does. It guides you into all truth. John 16, verse 13. I'm back in the notes now, at least for the moment. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide he you, will into, guide all you truth. into all truth. Now, I like to point out, if, if Jesus used this qualifier, all truth, then it must be the case that there are some who have only some truth. Or there would have been no need to say, he'll lead you into all truth. So just because you've got truth doesn't mean you've got all truth. And I'm telling you, I'm finding even, even 40 plus years later, that there are times that God still leads me into some truth that I was not aware of, that I didn't realize. Usually when he does, it's the truth about how he feels about something that I need to change in my life. But the Spirit leads us into all truth. All truth. All right? Um, Let me tell you what else the Spirit does. It brings the Lord's words to our remembrance. John 14, verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. He shall teach you all things. And, bring all and things, all he's things going to bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I've said unto you. The Holy Ghost will bring to your remembrance what the Lord has said. Now, I'm telling you, I'd never thought about before, but it was in the Scriptures. Hallelujah. It was in the Scriptures. I was, I was, uh, one, one of my lessons, I was teaching on baptism in Africa. And, you know, I've, I've taught this lesson, taught this lesson, taught this lesson. That particular day, evidently somebody needed to hear this. And I got to preaching about how the devil hates this message of baptism. And all of a sudden something hit me that the Lord had said in the word of God I'd never thought about before. And, and I looked at those preachers and I said, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says when an unclean spirit's gone out of a man, that he goes about in dry places. The devil's much more comfortable as long as there's no water around. As long as we're not taking folks to the baptistry, we got a dry place. And that's where the unclean spirits like to dwell. So you preachers need to get out there and start baptizing people. I forget how many we end up baptizing in that particular meeting. I'd never used that before. But I'm just telling you, there's times when the Spirit can bring things to your remembrance that the Lord said that you hadn't even considered before. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to win souls. You just got to be praying and reading your Bible. And then trust God because He can bring, He can bring what? What did He say? He'll bring what? He'll bring what? Yeah, you're saying it right. I'm just trying to stress it. All things. Whatever he said. Whatsoever I have said. God can jog your memory. If it's there, if you've read it. Now, if you've never read it, he can't remind you of what you've never read. But you don't have to know it. You don't have to memorize it for the Holy Ghost to bring it to your mind. Well, praise God. Uh, Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, here's this past time, um, doctrinal conference in Harari, this last trip that I made, uh, you know, I've I've told you that I get the same questions over and over and over. And it's always the same questions. And every time they think that I've never considered Genesis 126, God said, let us make man. Boy, they think when they throw that at me, I'm just going to stutter and stammer and have no answer. You know, or, or, or the baptism of Jesus and banks of Jordan River and what happened there or, or whatever, or, that, you know, if that day and that hour knoweth no man or Stephen's vision or whatever. I mean, it's, it's the same questions all the time. 
But I'm telling you, I got a question this last time that nobody's ever asked me. And I was so excited. I was so excited that I got a question I had not had. I really was. I thanked the guy over and over. Thank you for asking me this question. I am so glad I got a question that I have not been asked. And what made me think of it is this particular verse. Because the question was that that the Bible says that Jesus ever liveth to make intercession for us. And he said, if, if Jesus is God, if there's not two persons, how is he making intercession for us? Because the Trinity teaches that Jesus is interceding to the Father on our behalf. All right? So how is he making intercession for us? I like that question. And you want to know the answer? The answer is right here on the board. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings that... Now, who's making the groanings? Where are the groanings coming from? Huh? Us. We're the ones that are groaning. So you know what's happening? The Holy Ghost is praying through us. That's how he's making intercession. It's not one person in the Godhead making intercession to another. But the Bible said that Paul said this, through us, it uses our tongue, uses our lips, uses our voice. But we're the ones. Well, hallelujah. We just don't know how to do it. We, brother, brother Nelson, I can't do it on my own. I don't know what I'm supposed to be interceding for all the time. But I'll tell you this, if I can get lost in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost knows how to come. And all of a sudden there are groanings that cannot be uttered. There are sounds coming out of my mouth that I can't explain. And you know what's happening? It's the Holy Ghost that's using me to intercede on my behalf. Not one person interceding to another, but the Spirit interceding through me. Oh, hallelujah. And I'm telling you, if you don't have the Holy Ghost and you're not full of the Holy Ghost, you don't have this going on in your life. And listen to me. Sometimes the reason why you're overcome with something is because you didn't have this time of prayer. Sometimes the reason why the devil can throw you a curveball and you're laying flat on your face wondering, how did I get here? Is because you didn't spend time praying in the Spirit and letting the Holy Ghost make intercession through you. God knew that time was coming. God knew that difficult situation was in your path. Are you hearing me today? Listen, church, I know we walked in here and I said, I'm going to teach on the Holy Ghost. Everybody said, okay, all right. Well, I know about receiving the Holy Ghost. I'm still trying to help you understand some things here today. I want you to get a revelation of just how much you need it, not just to get you, uh, get you into the church, but to keep you until the trumpet sounds. We need this experience and we need it regularly. We need it often. Because God sees my tomorrow. God sees my next week. Down. You can walk in onto a job you felt secure in and all of a sudden they hand you a pink slip. And what happens now? And the tendency sometimes is fall apart. How am I going to make it? What am I going to do? No, no. I'm going to tell you, if you'll spend time letting the Holy Ghost intercede through you, number one, that pink slip may never come. Because he's interceding on your behalf. But even if it comes, all of a sudden you can feel a peace that you can't explain. Where did that come from? I'll tell you where it came from. It came from that prayer meeting you had. You didn't even know you were praying, God, I'm about to get fired. I'm going to have to have your peace to get through this. You didn't know you were praying that because you didn't understand what you were praying. But the Holy Ghost knew. 
and the Holy Ghost was preparing you for what was about to come. Oh, I hope you're hearing me today. I'm telling you, church, this is why we need the Holy Ghost. Not just a one-time experience of praying and talking in tongues and then never do it again. I'm telling you, every day, every day, every day. Get back to that place and let God fill you up again. Let him fill you up again and again and again and again. Because some of those times he's not just filling you up. He's doing something else on the inside of you. And he is interceding for things that you don't even know are coming your way. Oh, I feel this so strong this morning. I'm trying to help somebody. You don't know what this week holds. God, I feel this. I I wouldn't be surprised, Brother Hilton, but what this week may unfold for somebody as one of the worst weeks you've ever experienced. Now, don't live it scared. I'm going to tell you what you ought to do. You ought to hit this altar this morning, hit it again tonight, hit it first thing in the morning, and you just start praying. And you let God face whatever it is that's about to come your way. You let God take care of it in his time and in his method. For I know who holds tomorrow. And I know who holds my hand. Hallelujah. I'm just going to walk with him every day. And I'm going to let him face these problems. And I'm going to let him do something on the inside of me. Pray through me when necessary. Oh, you know what? I don't need to take much longer because I need to give you time to get down here. Ooh, my time's already up. I didn't realize that. And I'm not finished yet. But you know what? Time says I am. So we'll just make a mark right here. And we'll come back to this. We'll start here and then we'll go on from here. Next week, Lord willing. But we gotta have at least a few minutes here before we, before we walk out of this building. We gotta, Sister Becca, hurry, 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 hurry. Amen. We gotta have a few minutes. We gotta have a few minutes here before everybody's roast burns or the lines get too long at, at, uh, wherever you're going today. Uh, we gotta have a few minutes because you need to reach out to God. I'm telling you, you need, you need a fresh infilling of the Holy Ghost. Oh, hallelujah. You need a fresh infilling of the Holy Ghost. I need a fresh infilling of the Holy Ghost. Whenever I start getting worried, it's a sure sign. I need some more Holy Ghost. When I start getting depressed, it's a sure sign. I need some more Holy Ghost. And I'm afraid it's a sure sign. You know why? Because perfect love casts out fear. Now, what is perfect love? That's the love of God. Well, how do I get the love of God? The love of God is shed, in your, uh, shed abroad in your hearts by... The Holy Ghost. So if the love of God is put in your heart by the Holy Ghost and love of God casts out fear, please tell me why a child of God should ever be afraid of anything. God's not given us a spirit of fear. But of power and love and a sound mind. Now, isn't that interesting? Power. Where do we get power? God didn't give us a spirit of fear. He gave us the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost ought to take care of all that for us. Oh, come on. Let's let's gather around the front this morning. I know it's late. I know it's late. But I'm telling you, you ought to come down here and at least lift your hands and tell God, Lord, I want you to fill me with the Holy Ghost again. I want to be full of the Holy Ghost.